At precisely 4.40 a.m. on the 21st of March, 1918, a single white rocket soared into the night sky above the town of St. Quentin. It was a signal for over 10,000 German guns and mortars to thunder into action. More than a million German soldiers were ready to follow in the wake of their thunderous bombardment. This was the Kaiserschlacht, the Emperor's Battle. The turning point of the First World War, its outcome would be fought for here, in the Line of Fire. By 1918, it was clear that the German nation could not stand another year of the defensive warfare which had been draining the lifeblood from the country since the terrible Battle of Verdun in the spring of 1916. The deadlock and stalemate of four years of static trench warfare had exacted a heavy price from all involved. Any vestiges of the martial arrogance displayed in 1914 had long since been lost. By the end of 1917, Germany as a nation and as a country is facing numerous dilemmas. Perhaps the uh, one that loomed largest in the German civilian population was the impact of the Allied naval blockade. The Royal Navy had instituted a blockade of Germany two days before the outbreak of war uh, in August 1914. And while this had taken years to have a real impact, by the end of 1917, the German people were really suffering real shortages of food, clothing, heating and lighting. The civilian population had become increasingly against the war. In the Easter of 1917, the German Reichstag, the parliament, had passed a resolution calling for a peace on the basis of no annexations and no indemnities. So even the German elites were beginning to turn profoundly against the war. So there was a problem, and the unpopularity of the military uh, domination of government also meant that Germany did need to do something at the end of 1917. Despite their desperate situation, there were some reasons for optimism on the German side. The Russians had toppled over into Bolshevism and revolution and had completely withdrawn from the war. Furthermore, the Italians were routed at Caporetto in October 1917, essentially ending their contribution. However, these events were quickly overshadowed by another, greater development. There was a new player in the Great War, America. The immediate cause of the American entry was, of course, the unrestricted submarine campaign, which led to the deaths of many hundred Americans drowned when their ships were sunk, and the general barbarity of attacking ships, especially passenger ships, without warning. In addition, there was the very ill-advised German offer to Mexico of territorial gains at the expense of America if they came into the war and this outraged American opinion. Now in April 1917, uh, the Americans were completely unprepared for war and all of the combatant powers realized that it would take at least a year for the American army to become proficient and in such numbers that it would actually influence the outcome of the war. That meant that the Germans had a window of opportunity. If they could actually beat Britain and France by roughly April, May 1918, then the Americans would be too late to influence the outcome of the war. To this end, the German staff worked feverishly over the winter to come up with a plan that could be sprung into action early in 1918. The brainchild of German general Ludendorff, the Kaiserschlacht, or Kaiser's attack, was designed to use surprise, shock and speed to smash through the junction where the British and French lines met. The British army could then be rolled back to the channel. This could well be the last card in the dwindling German deck. By early 1918, it was unlikely that the Germans were going to run, win an outright right victory. So what they aimed to do was to effectively knock the British out of the war 
divide them from the French, get a negotiated peace to their advantage before the Americans came in. The idea was to strike the British and drive them in a northwesterly direction against the Channel ports. This would either force them to contemplate an evacuation of their army, such as happened in 1940, or at the very least to reconstruct their supply system in a very big way. It would also, of course, create a great gap between the British and the French, because as the British withdrew towards the Channel ports, the French would in all probability have to withdraw to cover Paris. So a great gap would open, and the hope the intention was that this would create a military situation so serious that the French would sue for terms. Although it had all the hallmarks of a final roll of the dice, the German high command was convinced it would be a success. On the 23rd of January, Kaiser Wilhelm was presented with the plans for what was codenamed Operation Michael an operation soon named Kaiserschlacht in his honour. Tactics were fine-tuned and new intensive training planned for all participants. Thousands of soldiers would be moved from the now-defunct Eastern Front to support the offensive. The Kaiserschlacht was most definitely a desperate gamble. Ludendorff had to achieve a decisive victory, a strategic victory. Local victories, such as the British had won at the Somme in 1916, would not do. He was using the last of the troops, and he had to get a big victory. The only other alternative really open to Germany is to sit and wait, uh, to try and hold out against the Allies and wear them down through defensive warfare. But of course, a strategy of defensive warfare was exactly uh, the, the policy adopted by Ludendorff in 1917 and the grinding battles uh, of Third Ypres fought against the British during that year had ground down the German army to quite an extent uh, and Ludendorff at the end of 1917 said that a defensive strategy simply wasn't an option because the German army would not maintain its cohesion. Had the Germans been able to uh, bruise, batter and possibly force the British army into an evacuation, um, the French would have found it very difficult indeed to hold the line against the entire German forces. It should be remembered that the French army was in a very delicate condition. In 1917 there had been extensive mutinies and these had only been saved by avoiding too much fighting. The French army and the French nation were profoundly tired of the war. So if the plan enjoyed maximum success or near maximum success, then the chances were good for Germany. The commander-in-chief of the British forces, upon whom the storm was about to burst, was Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. Much maligned and at loggerheads with Prime Minister Lloyd George, he was certainly a realist, and in early December 1917, instructed his army commanders to prepare their defences against a strong and sustained attack expected to come in the spring. Haig was very much a dyed-in-the-wall cavalryman, a professional soldier who saw things in military terms. He was Oxford and Sandhurst. He had uh, connections with the royal family through his wife, and he was very much there for, if you like, the true blue um, soldier. His relationship with Lloyd George could probably best be described as poisonous. The two men hated one another cordially. Haig believed that Lloyd George was a typical swindling politician of Welsh extraction, and Lloyd George believed that Haig was simply a butcher. Curiously, however, I'm not sure this greatly affected the conduct of the war. They both needed each other. Lloyd George would have sacked Haig if he could reasonably have replaced him with somebody else. But he couldn't, and so they had to achieve some kind of working relationship. The two commanders who would eventually face the Kaiserschlacht were General Sir Hubert Goff whose 5th Army held 42 miles of front on the British extreme right, and General Sir Julian Bing, whose 3rd Army held 28 miles below Arras, including the vulnerable Flesquier salient. 
the commanders drew up preparations for what was described as an elastic defence in depth. Elastic defence in depth was a technique which had been pioneered by the Germans in 1916 and 1917. When the British and the French were attacking then, it was discovered that with enough artillery preparation, the front and indeed the second and sometimes the third lines could always be taken because they were obliterated by the artillery bombardment. The logical response therefore was to thin out the front line and so reduce the casualties and extend the defence backwards for several miles towards the rear. This reduced the impact of the shelling and indeed put many of the defenders outside the range of the artillery bombardment and so defence in depth. The elastic bit is to have reserves nearby so that when the enemy troops try to occupy the destroyed trenches, you can launch a counter-attack against them. So there is a sort of elastic reaction against them. You allow them into a certain amount of territory, and then with a counter-attack, you bang them back. Three zones were to be readied. The front line was to be the forward zone. Containing a few strongly garrisoned redoubts surrounded by smaller outposts, this was intended only to cushion the initial impetus of an attack, resisting for up to 48 hours before giving way. With good reason, the men in this zone grumbled to themselves that they were serving in sacrifice units. The main fighting was designed to take place in the battle zone. Here were placed more troops, stronger defensive positions and most of the artillery. Further back was a rear zone, a third set of defences in case the battle zone fell. Unfortunately, the limitations of time and manpower saw little work completed on this much needed scheme. In all sectors, work on the rear zone was barely begun. Furthermore, Goff's Fifth Army was in the process of taking over a long section of the line from the hard pressed French and found its defences inadequate at best. Goth, who came in for an enormous amount of criticism during the Kaiserschlacht, argued later that uh, only with a, a great wand, a fairy wand, could he possibly have achieved the defences that were necessary in the few weeks available to him. He calculated, for example, that he required 300 miles of trenches and barbed wire within his battle zone for it to be effective and it would have taken anything up to six months for the signalers to bury all the landlines, all the communications, so that they couldn't be hit by the artillery. These problems were compounded by a major reorganisation of the British army structure. The supply of fresh troops for France was dwindling, so Haig was forced to disband one battalion in four and allocate the men to the reinforcements. This meant that three battalions now had to do the work designed for four. Manpower was one of the few problems which the Germans did not encounter. Ludendorff chose three armies to carry out the attack, led by the cream of his officer cadre. From battle group Ruprecht, with the second army under von der Marwitz, leader of the brilliant counterattack at Cambrai, and to their north, the 17th army. The latter were led by General von Belo, the hero of Caporetto. To the south were the 18th army, part of battle group Crown Prince Wilhelm, and commanded by General von Hutier, who had achieved glory at Riga against the Russians. But there were several differences between the troops from the eastern and the western fronts. A principal one, perhaps, is that the troops in the east were more used to victory. They had been fighting the Russians, and they generally had victories when they attacked the Russians. The problem with Russia was, of course, there was so much distance that it was hard to make the victory decisive. But the morale was good uh, for that reason. This meant that their temperament um, was perhaps not suited to the western front where blows were much bloodier 
uh, and battles tended to need sustained stamina, something that the troops in the East really hadn't experienced over the past three years. So there was an imbalance in morale and also the troops in the East had been trained in the new breakthrough tra tactics. The ones in the West took a bit longer to adapt them uh, to, to the new conditions. Um, so this imbalance meant that in the spring of 1918, Ludendorff was almost welding two separate armies to, together. 74 divisions were concentrated behind the 50-mile front, outnumbering the enemies by two to one. Training was intensive. Over 800,000 men had undergone three weeks of instruction on the tactics of the coming battle. They were led by special units given the very best training in mobile warfare, the elite stormtrooper formations. Divisions were divided into three categories, mobile, attack and trench. The mobile divisions were to spearhead the attack, breaking through the weakest points and pressing forward rapidly until exhausted. It was in these divisions that the new stormtrooper units were to be found. They were armed with the best weapons and were given extra rations. The attack divisions were to follow close in support, mopping up any pockets of resistance and were similarly equipped. The trench divisions, intended only to hold the line, were stripped to the bone to ensure supplies for their comrades in the mobile and attack categories. German tactics had been evolving uh, both on the Western Front and the Eastern Front over the past three years. But the first uh, point that we can really identify as a real change, uh, a real sea change in German tactics, is the Battle of Riga in 1917 where the idea of infiltration tactics and hurricane bombardments are first used on a large scale. This meant that German artillery would be concentrated to blast a gap in the enemy's defences, which would then be exploited by the infantry. But the infantry, rather than using the uh, relatively static uh, and formal uh, skirmish lines advancing towards the enemy, instead had been trained to operate in small groups uh, of fast-moving, uh, relatively lightly equipped men, certainly not carrying their packs, who would break through and infiltrate into an enemy position. The German infantry were trained to move as fast as possible, to move around strong points, to move around defended areas and leave follow-up waves to knock them out. They had to penetrate as deeply as possible, as fast as possible, because that disorganised the enemy response, it disorganised the communications and so forth. So speed of movement. And they carried lots of grenades, and they carried lots of light automatic weapons, submachine guns, heavy firepower for fast moving troops. This was the basic procedure that they followed for the Kaiserschlag. The days immediately preceding the attack saw thousands of German troops move up to their starting positions. Their morale was high and they were convinced this would be the final push to victory. Misinformation had deliberately been allowed to pass into Allied hands via carrier pigeon, drifting balloons and other diversionary ruses which convinced the Allies that the French were about to be attacked. The Germans put a huge amount of emphasis upon surprise. The attack must come as a great surprise. And so artillery was moved up and ranged onto the British positions with great care. The troops were brought up with great care. Great care was taken to avoid any reconnaissance photographs showing the movement, the direction, and indeed the imminence of the attack. The idea was to pack as many guns into as small a frontage as possible and thus overwhelm the enemy's frontline defences with literally a hurricane, uh, a torrent of shot and shell. At 4.40 a.m. on March the 21st, a single white rocket rose high in the sky above St Quentin and all hell was let loose. <laughs> 
before March the 21st, 1918, the German artillery was able to assemble what became known as Ludendorff's battering train. Over 6,477 guns disposed over a 40 mile front. This meant that when the bombardment began, they rained down over one and a half million shells in just four hours, uh, a quite unimaginable uh, torrent of shot and shell on the British defence, forward defences. They combed back and forth with the shells in the attacked area, from the front lines to the reserve lines to the headquarters and back again, seeking to destroy communications and headquarters as well as the troop lines. They used heavy mortars to attack the barbed wire and the trenches. A new view of the way in which you use artillery. Very intense, but very short. And intending really to stun the defenders rather than to kill them. Shell shock, disorientation and confusion was the aim of the bombardment, destroying resistance for the advancing troops. To facilitate this, 80% of the shells fired contained gas, chemical warfare on an unprecedented scale. The majority of this was Green Cross phosgene gas, which dispersed quickly, thus causing the German attackers no distress as they followed up on the heels of the bombardment. The lingering Yellow Cross mustard gas was used only on the Flesquier salient which the Germans were hoping to outflank rather than assault head-on. The Germans also made innovative use of tear gas, hoping the discomfort caused would make British soldiers remove their gas masks and fall prey to the deadly phosgene. Although soldiers on both sides were by now well used to wearing gas masks, they were still uncomfortable and extremely disorienting, restricting vision and communication. The confusion spread by a gas attack was a particularly effective way of softening up the enemy before an attack. And there were two ways of using gas. One was by canisters. You simply opened the canisters and let the, the cloud come out. The disadvantage of that was if the wind changed, it came back into your, own, uh, into your own face, and that wasn't terribly attractive. The more effective way of using gas was to use shells. The Germans used gas liberally particularly mustard gas, uh, almost as a defensive weapon. Mustard gas was what was known as a persistent agent. It would lie on the ground and remain active for a number of days after the guns had fired it. This made it very difficult for troops to take up positions there uh, and to hold the ground, as mustard gas was a particularly nasty agent. Basically, it was an irritant and it attacked the eyes, the mouth, tongue, and of course the lungs and in the lungs in particular, it created a pooling of fluid which gradually rose until the victim literally drowned because of the fluid in their lungs. It could blind people as well. It was a terrible weapon. The ethical considerations of using gas seem not to have worried uh, either side in the First World War. They simply saw it as a, a tool of war, and while there had been cries of outrage when the Germans first used gas, uh, at Ypres in 1915, uh, by 1916 both sides were using gas quite liberally. At 9.40 a.m. the first waves of the infantry moved out. Advancing behind the creeping artillery barrage and aided by a thick swirling fog that covered the battlefield, they made good progress, infiltrating deep into the forward zone within half an hour penetrating quickly past the well-defended redoubts, often unnoticed. The second attack wave was only 100 yards behind and soon took these in flanking movements. After only 90 minutes fighting, very few of the British redoubts designed to last 48 hours were still holding out. With the forward zone secure, the German troops quickly moved into the battle zone, the creeping barrage moving forward 200 metres every four minutes. Von Belo's troops were able to push part of the Third Army to the rear of their battle zones, 
and had made advances round the north of the Flesquier salient. However, to the south, two 5th Army divisions had held magnificently, maintaining the Epihi Redoubt and stopping the salient from being surrounded. The salient had been saved, but the line was pulled back slightly to lessen the danger. Further south, Whilst Goff's 16th Division had been pushed to the back of its battle zone, 18 Corps had held six miles in its entirety. Worst hit was the overextended 3rd Corps south of St. Quentin. By 5.30 p.m., they were pushed out of their battle zone entirely. Goff reacted swiftly to this desperate situation. Trying to organize French reinforcements, and personally visiting his corps commanders, he threw in most of his reserves and gave Third Corps permission to withdraw behind the Crozat Canal. Haig, meanwhile, was abreast of developments and, aware of German intentions to push the British toward the north, felt the Fifth Army could be allowed to be pushed west, where they lost little of strategic value, but crucially, kept in touch with the French. By the end of the first day of Kaiserschlacht, Ludendorff had driven the British from 140 square miles of French soil at a cost of 40,000 German and 38,500 British casualties, of whom 21,000 were prisoners. Schools were closed in celebration and bells rang out across Germany. It was a remarkable triumph. At the end of the first day, the Germans had achieved against the British Fifth Army the greatest one-day penetration ever achieved during the First World War. They had achieved a stunning success. Goff's Fifth Army had been pushed basically almost entirely out of its defensive zone. It was just about outside of the area of elastic defence in depth. The problem with the British defence in depth uh, was that they had not fully understood the German use of counter-attack to retake positions. The Germans had managed to advance over six miles uh, in places, actually reaching the British gun line. Thus the ferocity of the German attack had not been fully anticipated. Elsewhere, however, against the Third Army, for example, just to the north, of the 5th Army, the attack, though it were, had been successful, was less stunningly successful. Defence was working better there. And all over the battlefield, small parties of British troops were still fighting. There had not been a general panic, and already the alarm bells were beginning to be sounded, and reserves were beginning to be alerted, beginning to be moved to contain the German uh, penetration. So at the end of the first day, the advance was really, it was almost um, a draw, if you like. The Germans had not made the penetration actually that they wanted to make because they had to keep impetus going. Without that impetus, then it would come to a halt. Even though they'd made inroads in the south, essentially it was still a draw with the third army still holding firm. The subsequent two days saw further advances but these generally came in the south, where Goff's 5th Army was struggling to retreat in order and was losing touch with both the French on its right and Bing's 3rd Army on its left. Six promised divisions of French reinforcements began to arrive, but they got caught up in the general disarray. Thrown straight into the dogged fighting until they were overwhelmed, they soon started falling back with the British. The situation facing the better resourced Third Army seemed to stabilize. Von Belo made little progress as the Third Army drew on reinforcements from the neighboring British armies to the north. However, Bing was forced to relinquish much of his right wing just to stay in contact with Goff's army and maintain the integrity of the British line. First, Bapaume, then Albert were given up, the soldiers reluctantly withdrawing over the devastated Somme battlefields 
they had gained at such cost in 1916. If the German pressure on the French increased, uh, and indeed if the British and French armies were continued uh, to, to pull apart, then a gap would emerge that the Germans could exploit. This had to be stopped at all costs. If any kind of gap uh, emerged, uh, the Germans could exploit, could flow through that gap, and begin to turn the British flank. And in order to prevent a split from happening, it did not matter that much if the British retreated and gave up towns such as Bapaume and Albert, which were synonymous with the Battle of the Somme. It would dismay the public, but surrender of territory was, by comparison with the possibility of a split opening, of far less consequence. And so, to some extent, the British were willing to trade distance so long as they retreated in a direction that maintained contact with their French allies. All this time, the British rear had been a hive of activity, with busy soldiers rapidly constructing fresh trenches and strongholds. The army was falling back into a rear well stocked with supplies and, increasingly, reinforcements. Over 10,000 a day were pouring across the channel. The Germans, however, were coming to the limits of their logistical abilities. The artillery was unable to keep pace with their infantry, and the exhausted soldiers were rapidly running out of food. The Germans were advancing over old, devastated battlefields. They were going through areas of rusty wire, old trenches, shell holes. It was very difficult going, very exhausting, very tiring, and it was very difficult for their supply columns to keep up with them. At the same time, the British, by going backwards, were actually going into friendly territory and their own ammunition and supply dumps. So for the British, in a, in a strange way, retreating helped them. As the German soldiers advanced, they came upon Allied supply dumps, which had been abandoned in the chaos of defeat. They found beer, they found shoes, they found uniforms and clothing in profusion. And it's no wonder then that the German stormtroops that came upon these uh, items uh, began to drink themselves silly, uh, causing real discipline problems, uh, and indeed believing that they could not beat the Allies. Uh, these were supplies uh, which the German soldier hadn't seen for years. There were probably a few cases of this, but it's one of those very good stories which are endlessly repeated because they produce an amusing picture, but the reality was that that was much less important than the sheer problem of supplying the troops and so keeping the momentum of the offensive going. Supply proved to be a very great problem for the Germans and one indeed which they did not succeed in solving. While the war raged among muddy trenches and smoking ruins, a new battlefield had emerged. Aerial combat had reached new levels. Up to this point, most aerial fighting had been around photography, reconnaissance and spotting for artillery shelling. Each side tried to achieve aerial dominance so that its reconnaissance and spotting planes could operate unimpeded. But by 1918, aircraft had developed sufficiently for both sides to think about them as agencies of attack directly upon ground troops. And so both sides tried to use aircraft to bomb troops and to machine gun troops, both on the battlefield and in the areas, the roads leading up to the battlefield. Very quickly, uh, the RAF and the French Air Service were actually able to wrest control of the air from the Germans. Perhaps because they were actually, the British were retreating back on, onto their air bases, and because by this time the Royal Flying Corps, and then as it became known, the, the Royal Air Force, were actually much stronger than the Germans in the air. And by wresting control of the air from the Germans, while the RAF wasn't able to prevent the German troops on the ground advancing, it certainly hampered and hindered their efforts. Uh, and on numerous days, uh, low-flying uh, British aircraft were able to strafe uh, large columns of German troops advancing. Thus, Allied air superiority was a key factor in slowing down and hampering the German uh, advances. <laughs> 
The strain of the battle began to test the nerve of General Ludendorff, which was not helped by the loss of his son on the first day of the battle, nor by the symptoms of his exophthalmic goiter. Ludendorff was facing a dilemma, whether to continue his initial plan or exploit the opportunities of breakthrough presented in the South, despite the lack of any clear strategic objective there. Believing the Fifth Army to be routed and hoping to take advantage of their perceived collapse, Ludendorff made the fateful decision to divide the thrust of his attack. The push against the Third Army would continue as planned with Arras as its objective. However, Houtier would also continue his assault to the southwest, exploiting his successes there rather than simply maintaining a supporting position as expressly intended. This would necessarily lessen the force of the thrust in the north, his forces pushing in different directions. Ludendorff would be criticised, of course, whichever direction he chose to move. If he persevered with the attack to the northwest, it would be said he lacked imagination, he could not adapt to the realities of battle. If he moved his forces strongly to the southwest, it would show that he lacked perseverance, that he lacked determination, that he was inconstant. In point of fact, he chose to put the principal thrust to the southwest on the reasonable proposition that he should follow the logic of the battle. This was not what he had intended, but opportunity occurs in a battle, as well as determined battle plans, and you should take opportunity when it knocks. And in that respect, possibly his experience as a battle commander uh, was shown. At the same time, the French began to reinforce the beleaguered Fifth Army. By the end of March, they had relieved Goff's men of most of their line. The 3,000-strong South African Brigade fought a magnificent eight-hour stand against two entire German divisions 18,000 strong, with less than a hundred South Africans surviving to march into captivity. The 2nd Middlesex Regiment suffered 75% losses in a 12-hour defence of Bree Bridge. At this desperate juncture, Haig met with his French counterpart, Pétain. To Haig's surprise, Pétain suggested that the two forces should split, allowing the French to concentrate on defending Paris. It seemed that Pétain's resolve to carry on had simply crumbled. He appeared to have a mental breakdown. In order to combat this, Haig dramatically proposed that the more resolute General Foch be made a generalissimo, a unifying commander of the Allied forces. The appointment of Foch as supreme commander was tremendously important. The basic German plan was to divide the British and the French forces. By having one overall commander, you make it plain in a symbolic fashion that this is not going to happen, but you also make it possible to ensure practically that it doesn't happen because one commander can coordinate the movement of reserves, can coordinate strategy, so that the division does not take place. It would be unthinkable to have anybody other than a Frenchman who was in charge on French soil. The choice was between Foch and Pétain, and Pétain had pessimistically said he felt that Haig was going to be beaten, and if Haig was beaten, there was a likelihood that the French would be beaten. Foch came up and said, not likely. I can actually um, win the battle. By agreeing to the appointment of a Frenchman, the British showed the French that they were committed to the war, that they would, to a degree, entrust their British forces to the command of a Frenchman. It was a way of bolstering French confidence in the British at a time when both sides were one worrying slightly about each other's commitment to the war. By the end of the 27th of March, the German advances had slowed down considerably. The strains of six days' continuous fighting were now taking their toll. Despite this, Ludendorff chose to continue the series of attacks. Once again, adapting his plans as opportunities presented themselves. The original grand strategy was now completely compromised 
in favor of far more limited tactical objectives. Still tempted by the southern sector of the front, Ludendorff ordered a frontal offensive on the city of Amiens. A vital rail and communication center for the Allies, Amiens would certainly be a glittering prize. In reality, it was a costly distraction in terms of both men and munitions, especially as the long-planned Mars offensive against the British center at Arras was scheduled to start at the same time. Ludendorff had tried and failed to drive the British from their central battlefields. Instead, they remained steadfast. In fact, the situation was considered secure enough for the king to visit Bing's army late on the 29th. Elsewhere, the battle continued and raged as hard as ever in front of Amiens. The situation facing the 5th Army there remained desperate. This was complicated further by the replacement of General Goff. A political scapegoat for the retreat, Goff was replaced by General Rawlinson. The Kaiserslaut was undoubtedly a major British defeat. It involved the British Army in their biggest retreat of the war. There was no escaping this fact. The public could see it. You could not deny it. Somebody had to take responsibility for this major disaster. To have pretended that nothing much terrible had happened and to carry on regardless was impossible. Someone had to carry the can. It was impossible that it should be Haig. Perhaps he carried the major responsibility because he had inspected Goff's defences before the attack began and pronounced them satisfactory. But it was politically impossible to sack Haig. He was the British commander-in-chief. The message that this would send to the Germans, to the British public and to the allies of the British would have been impossible at this stage of the war. So it had to be a lower commander. Much later, Haig looked back and said that it was quite clear at that stage they needed a scapegoat. And he admitted freely that it was either him or Goff. And he said that, uh, perhaps arrogantly, that he had decided that it was better for the army that he stayed on rather than Goff. So in the short term, it was Haig that sacrificed Goff, if you like, for his own military skin. Rawlinson inherited only six divisions still in line, with four on the move. The French had taken over some of the old line, and Foch was busy organizing a reserve of both forces to come to their aid. Goff, however, had established the villiers bretonneau line, defenses 15 miles to the east of Amiens. This was chiefly held by a ragtag bunch known as Carey's Force. Under Major General George Carey, this improvised detachment included American engineers and an entire signals company and was responsible for protecting the city. On the 4th of April, the city was saved from imminent capture only by a daring last-ditch counterattack led by the Australian 36th Battalion. Nonetheless, the British artillery began to withdraw. But a small force of Australian and British reserve troops emerged from the positions. Inspired by the leadership of Colonel J. Milne, they successfully pushed back a far greater force of the 9th Bavarian Division. This gave fresh hope to the other Allied troops, and further counterattacks ensued. Ludendorff exhorted Marwitz's exhausted 2nd Army to one final push on the 5th of April. Supported by gas shelling and stormtroopers, the struggle was as fierce as ever. However, once again, the Allied line held. Much of the strain taken up by a variety of Dominion forces. By the evening, it was clear that the offensive had failed, and Ludendorff ordered all attacks to cease. Kaiserschlacht had ended on its 16th day. As Ludendorff himself said, the enemy's resistance was beyond our powers. But at what price had this resistance come? The British alone had lost 178,000 casualties, 
of which 72,000 were now prisoners of war. The average daily loss had been three times that of the Somme. The 5th Army had been hit harder than the 3rd, and three divisions had lost over 7,000 men. The French had also been significantly hit, suffering 77,000 casualties, 18,000 of whom were held prisoner. The Allies had given up 1,200 square miles of land. They had also lost 1,300 artillery pieces, 2,000 machine guns, 400 aircraft, 200 tanks, and countless armoured cars and horses. However, the Germans themselves had incurred 239,000 casualties. For a nation stretched almost to breaking point, these men and all the munitions expended were now impossible to replace. Kaiserschlacht had simply brought them a stage closer to defeat. While large amounts of territory had been taken, while the offensives had begun with much sound and fury, they had accomplished, in reality, nothing apart from the real destruction of the German army. Yes, the Allies had been battered, but at no point had the Kaiserschlacht really inflicted any strategic damage on either the British or French. On the strategic level, then, Kaiserschlacht was a complete and abject failure. At the tactical level, the Kaiserschlacht, however, uh, displayed what the new tactics uh, of modernity uh, and indeed the combination of arms uh, could actually achieve. Infiltration tactics became the basis for all infantry tactics of all armies uh, throughout the world uh, and have, in their essentials, remained the same to this day. So tactically, the Kaiserschlacht uh, was very impressive, but the difference between tactical success and strategic success was one which Ludendorff couldn't bridge. Kaiserschlacht is not as renowned as other battles of the First World War, but the bravery of the men who fought on all sides was as remarkable as at any other. After only a few days of fighting, ten men were awarded the Victoria Cross. However, perhaps it is best to leave the last word to one who fought that day, W. W. Francis, 7th King Shropshire Light Infantry. For God's sake and common humanity, do not write about honour and glory. There was none. War, especially ours, was a stinking, ugly, horrible business.